We are teaching a sermon series, beginning a sermon series entitled The Blood of Christ. And today's message is entitled Drawing Near to God. Our text is found in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. So if you'll turn there with me and once you're there say I'm there. Very good. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. I'm going to start with the New King James Version. And it reads, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Those who were far off, and he's he's really referring to Gentiles, those who are outside the covenant at this point. Those who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to read it in the New Living Translation. And you know me, I'm, I'm a pretty big King James guy. But when we're getting to, into some serious doctrinal revelations, we got to put it in everyday English sometimes. Are you with me? Is that okay today? Okay, so I'm going to do some of the passages in the New Living Translation so we can sort of wrap our spirit around it and get the revelation. It'll help us in our faith walk. So same passage, same verse, but this time in the New Living Translation. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, but now you, and the you there is referring to Jews and Gentiles, have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you, referring to Gentiles, were far away from God. But now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. Now, nearness to God is the great desire of all believers. Really, I think it's the desire of all people to draw near to God, certainly among believers. And in the Old Testament, we have a revelation of the tabernacle. We have the revelation of the temple where nearness to God was gained in phases. You had the outer court, you had the holy place, and you had the holy of holies. You had the majority of the people in the outer court. That's where the sacrifices were made you know the altar the brazen labor and so on and so forth and then you had the holy places that's where the showbread the candelabras the the table of incense representing the prayers being lifted up but then you had the holy of holies God did not meet you in the outer court God did not meet you even in the holy place God met you in the holy of holies when blood was applied to the mercy seat. The deal was that only one person once a year on the Day of Atonement was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And so we get this revelation. We get this uh, picture that is very difficult to, to enter into the presence of God. But something has changed all that. I said something's changed all that. We just read it. The blood of Jesus Christ has invited everybody, Jew and Gentile, everybody is welcome into the presence of God because of the blood. I said because of the blood. This is a very important revelation because of so very often, even as believers, we find ourselves dwelling in the outer court. And we don't get any farther than the outer court. It's sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. And we're trying to earn our way into the Holy of Holies. Maybe if I make another sacrifice, God will be happy with me. Maybe if I make another sacrifice, well, I messed up again. Let me make another sacrifice and see if I can be ushered into the presence of God this time. And we never get past the outer court because we believed a lie. We believe that God is mad at us. We have to earn our way into His presence. And God is never satisfied with our sacrifice. Let me tell you something. God has been satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years. And He is not denying anybody entrance into His presence. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't care how bad you just messed up. The blood gets you in. I said, I don't care how many times you have messed up. The blood gets you in. 
I don't care what the devil has told you. The blood gets you in. I don't care what religion has told you. The blood gets you in. There is nothing that can keep you out of the presence of God unless you believe a lie. And I'm here to tell you the truth today. There's nothing that can keep you out of the presence of God. Hallelujah. I want you to believe these three great revelations. One, God loves you beyond measure. Number two, you are accepted by God according to grace. Number three, God seeks to do you good all day long. And if you will attach your faith to those three revelations, you are going to be the happiest Christian on the block. Hallelujah. Turn to a neighbor and say, I'm feeling happy. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody else and say, I like this teaching so far. Praise the Lord. You want to be in the presence of God because the Bible says in thy presence there is fullness of joy and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Come on church. You want to be in the presence of God because in his presence there is fullness of joy. See all the things that you feel that you've been you missing and lacking and all the, the, the empty spots in your being. There's fullness of joy that God can pour into your life. Hallelujah. At, at his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. God takes pleasure in you. He says, come on, sit, sit right beside. You know what? Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father and you are seated in heavenly places. Yeah. Hallelujah. Psalm 1611, on his right hand, there are, there are pleasures forevermore. On his right hand, who's sitting on his right hand? Christ Jesus. Who, who is seated in Christ in heavenly places? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are. We are. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I thought this was going to be a little teaching, and now I'm stomping my feet already. Glory to God. I'm, I'm teaching myself happy up here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Y'all need to come up here and look at these notes because this will make you happy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we've been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is unlike any other blood. The blood, come on, you got to hear that. The blood of Christ is unlike any other blood. Now, we all have blood from Adam on. Every, people have had, had blood. There's no shortage of blood, but the blood of Christ is different. Amen. The blood of Christ is different because it says specifically, we've been brought near to the Father, brought near to Him through the blood, but not anybody's blood, not just blood in general, not the blood of Christ, specifically the blood of that one person, the, the person of Jesus Christ. His blood seemed to make the difference. His blood is what gained us entrance into the very presence of God. His blood is, is unlike any other blood. What, what is it about blood that can bring us into the presence of of God. What, what, is the, what is it about blood that makes a way for a person to enter into the presence of God? Well, let me ask the question in, in a different way. What keeps you out of the presence of God? Uh, sin, of course, we know that. Sin keeps us, sin breaks the relationship. Sin is what separates us from God. When, when Adam sinned, he ran from God, he hid from God. Sin is what separates us from God. So if sin separates us from God, blood must be the antidote to sin. If sin keeps you out and blood brings you in, blood must be the antidote to sin. Uh, you know, if, if a snake bites you or you get poison or whatever, what do you want? The antidote. You want the thing that, that nullifies that poison in your system. You want the thing that undoes it, the thing that gives you life, where there was death creeping into your system. You want the antidote. Blood is the antidote to sin. It says in Hebrews 9 and 22, put this in your notes, without shedding of blood, there is no Remission from sin. 
without the shedding of blood. Isn't that interesting? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Uh, remission means pardon and, or freedom. There is no pardon from your sin. There's no freedom from your sin without the shedding of blood. So blood is the antidote to sin. Uh, I found this quote from Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth E. Hagen, in his little book, uh, it's a little mini book called The Precious Blood of Jesus. And he, he says this. He says, I don't know whether or not you can realize how precious health is until you are sick. I don't know whether or not you can realize how precious it is to live without pain until you have suffered pain. I don't know whether or not you realize how precious food is until you have suffered hunger. Hunger makes food precious. Thirst makes water precious. Poverty makes riches precious. Sin makes the blood of Jesus Christ precious. Because the blood is the only antidote to sin. But why his blood? What makes his blood so special. Well, to understand that, we have to understand the operation of law, uh, the, the law of Moses, the old covenant. We have to understand the operation of faith, the function of faith. Now, the law was given so that we could define what sin was. The law was given so that sin would be revealed. The law was given that we could define what righteousness is. The law was given that righteousness could be revealed. The law was given to point to the cure for sin. The law was a type, a symbol, a billboard, an advertisement for the coming solution, permanent solution absolute solution to sin the problem was that those who were living under the law began to believe that the law was the end all be all that the law was the cure to sin that the law was the obtainable righteousness and it has never been that way the law merely pointed to the law was not in itself the law was a arrow, a sign, a wonder of the coming solution. Are you still with me? All right. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. The law defines and reveals sin. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So the law reveals what sin is. But the law is not the solution to sin. That's the mistake people made. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, go back, that's our text uh, passage. Ephesians chapter 2. Two, and I'm going to stay in the New Living Translation. I'm going to look at verse 15 and 16. You see, the system of law did not bring anybody near to God. The system of law, didn't. if it was the answer, it would have brought people near to God. But we've read it's the blood that brought people near to God. If the law was the answer, the law would have brought people near to God. But we see from the law itself that only one person once a year on the Day of Atonement was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And they had to tie a chain to his leg with bells on it in case God struck him dead and they could pull him out. If the law was the solution, the law would have brought us near to God. But the law was just a system of revelation, not a solution. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. He, Jesus, did this. What's the this? Bring us near to God. Bring us near to God. Unite Jew and Gentile and bring them near to God. He did this by what ending? 
He ended the system of law with his commandments and regulations. Now, we're going to find out in just a minute. He didn't nullify it. He ended it by fulfilling it. He didn't deny it. He didn't nullify it. He fulfilled it. We'll get there in a second. He brought us near to God by ending the system of law and its commandments and its regulations. The law couldn't bring you near. So, so Jesus ended it. Okay, stay with me. Say, I'm with you, Pastor. He made, he made peace between Jew and Gentile, creating in himself one new people uh, from two groups, together as one body. Christ reconciled both groups to God. He brought them to God. How? By means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. Now, here's the revelation. Here's, and I want you to get this now. Here's the revelation. At the other end of the spectrum of law, there's faith. Law is what man could do. Faith recognizes what God does. Law is man trying to achieve. Faith is believing that God can do it. Man, law is believing that man can do it. You, you see the difference, okay? Now, justification doesn't come by law. Justification and righteousness comes by faith. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Are we doing okay with all these scriptures? Are y'all with me? Okay. Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. Man has always been made righteous by faith and not by law. Righteousness is imputed. Righteousness is not earned. Let's look at this in Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. Just as Abraham, now Abraham is hundreds of years before the law, Abraham believed God, that's faith, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Abraham believed God. Well, what was God telling him? God said, said you're going to have a son of promise. Abraham was an old man. Uh, his wife was along in years as well. It was in, they were beyond childbearing years. Yet he believed God. He believed the impossible. And God says, you know what? That's righteousness. You believe my word, that's righteousness. Okay? So righteousness came by believing. Righteousness comes by faith. All right, let's underscore this in Romans chapter 4, verse 20. Speaking of the same uh, issue with Abraham. Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Say, I have strong faith. Yes, you do. Believe in glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. And therefore it, the it there is faith, therefore faith was counted to him for righteousness. What made him righteous? Faith. All right, verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. In other words, God gave him something. God freely gave him something. What did he give him? Righteousness. What did he do to earn it? He just believed. It was just faith. But listen, it's not just Abraham. It, this doesn't work just for Abraham in verse 24, but also for us. It, righteousness, the it there is righteousness. Righteousness shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. We receive righteousness because it is imputed to us because of what Jesus has done. Not because of law, not because of works, but because of what Jesus has done. And we simply say, I believe that, I receive that, thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, here's, here's the problem with the law. No one could keep it in entirety. No one could keep the law. So the law was defeatist at the very beginning. The law revealed sin. The law defined sin. The law revealed righteousness. The law defined righteousness. But nobody could keep the entirety of the law. That's why Paul says in Galatians 3, chapter 10. I mean, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Again, I'm in the New Living. 
He says, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So, verse 11, everybody say so. so. Everybody say so. so. It is clear. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. James adds a footnote. James said in James 2 and 10, he says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. That's such an important point. No man, so it is clear, Paul said, no man is made righteous by the law. So we go back to our original question. What made Jesus' blood so special? What was it about Jesus? Remember our text, Ephesians 2 and 13. It says that we've been brought near to Him, the Father, through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a major point. And I want you to get this in your notes. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. This is skipped over so very often, and we're not going to skip over it today because this has great revelation attached to it. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, when the fullness of time had come, God brought, God brought forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So Jesus was subject to the law. Crucial. Jesus was subject to the law. God purposely brought Jesus along at the time, in the fullness of time, when the law was in force and he was born under the law, subject to all the points and the commandments of the law. Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, here's the key. The law reveals standards of righteousness, defines righteousness. The law reveals sin and defines sin. The law has a, an accepted standard of righteousness that everybody at that time was aware of. Everybody understood the law. Therefore, everybody understood righteousness. There was an accepted standard of righteousness. Jesus was born at a time when everybody knew what righteousness was, but nobody could keep it. Everybody knew God's standard of right living, but nobody could do it. But one man, the man Jesus Christ. So the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from our sins and has allowed us to enter into the Holy of Holies to meet with the presence of God because His blood is spotless. How do you know that, Pastor? Because of the, because of the law. Because of the law. The law says what is righteous and Jesus fulfilled the law. Therefore, Jesus is worthy to be recognized as the spotless Lamb of God. Nobody, nobody could point at Jesus and say, aha, there's the sin. I just saw him sin. I just saw him break the law. They tried. They tried to come up with that all the time. They simply couldn't do it. That's why when Jesus was crucified, he was not crucified for any named sin. He was crucified because they said he makes himself to be as God. And he was God. 
They crucified him for his deity, not for a sin. They couldn't find a sin. Everybody was in agreement that he was sinless. That's why Galatians 4 and 4 is so important. God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Born under what? The law. The law. He had to be born under the law. Because if you're going to say the blood of Jesus is the only blood sufficient to cleanse a man of his sins, then we all have to agree that his blood is holy and spotless. And we all have to agree on the standard of righteousness. Do you see? Why? Why would God come up with this complex system of mosaic law? Why would he do it? Because he had to tell the world what is right and what is wrong. He had to set a measure that somebody, the sinless substitute for the sinful world. He said there's only one way to cleanse a man of his sin. That is by the shedding of blood. But not just anybody's blood. It has to be a substitute. And not just any substitute. It has to be a sinless substitute. But we all have to agree that the substitute is sinless. So let's set up a system of righteousness so that everybody knows what is right and what is wrong. I'll bring in my son under that system. He's going to live his life in front of everybody. He's going to show the world that he is spotless. He is holy. He's the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the earth. And that makes his blood different. Hallelujah. 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 That's why Jesus said... Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5 and 17. He fulfilled it. He kept it jot and tittle. Even when they didn't even understand it. He interpreted it, he explained it, and he fulfilled it. Hallelujah. 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 What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying righteousness is not arbitrary. We have the law. But redemption is not arbitrary either. We have the blood. Hallelujah. Is anybody getting this this morning? That's why it says in Revelations 5 and 12... Worthy is the Lamb. I said worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. Everybody say worthy. 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 It's not just because he was a really nice guy. It's he did what no one else could do. And therefore God recognized him the way God would not recognize any other man. That's why his blood was different than any other blood that was ever been shed in all the history of the world. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and honor and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then in 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19 it says, Knowing... Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood, I was redeemed, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 2 and 22, speaking of Jesus, who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What makes the blood of Jesus so special? Because it was spotless. It was righteous. Everybody knew it was. And so do I. And so do you. So back to our text verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. And I'm going to tack on verse 18. 
It says, but now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Verse 18, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. The, the blood, listen to this, the blood has brought us near to Christ. The Holy Spirit has taken us in. You see, in the Old Testament, they had to offer blood, bulls and goats, and blood and blood and blood, blood. A constant offering of blood. The, 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 the land was flowing with blood. It, it was an unending daily offering of blood for every sin that you, that you could think of. But, but there was a lamb that changed all that. There was a, there was a spotless lamb, a perfect lamb, the lamb of God. John's, John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and the blood from, from that lamb only had to be spilled one time and it came down the cross and it went upon the altar in the throne room of glory and has been applied to the mercy seat and we don't need to apply blood anymore. The most perfect blood that has ever been has been applied to your heart has been applied to the mercy seat, has covered you so that you now can enter into the presence of God. That's not the end of the story. The blood has gained us access and entry, but the blood releases the anointing of the Holy Spirit that takes us into the presence of God. Every one of us, every one of us has access. All of us, it says it specifically right there, all of us. All of us have access. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did this morning. The blood still applies. Amen. Hallelujah. God's not leaving anybody out in the outer court. God's not leaving anybody even in the holy place. The, ra the veil has been rent. Hallelujah. The door has been opened. Glory to God. And all of us can come in. But listen, listen. It's the anointing. I read it right there. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit. The blood releases the anointing. The blood and the anointing are in agreement. I said the blood and the anointing. The blood is applied. The anointing is active. The blood says, come on in. The anointing says, let's go on in. Yeah. I, I, did you just get that? That's why so many people are standing on the outside. Even though that the blood has been applied and the access has been granted and the veil has been rent. But we're not allowing the anointing to take us into deeper places with God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to close and I'm going to read two more verses and I'm getting ready to close. And so, uh, uh, worship team, you can come on up. We're getting ready to wrap this up. Are you all still with me? Yeah. Can, can you hang in for two more passages? Okay, here we go. Now, I'm going to 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, New Living Translation. Now, the blood releases the anointing. The Spirit and the blood agree. Here we go. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by His baptism in water, water, and by the shedding of His blood on the cross, water and blood are in agreement, bear witness. Water was the beginning of His ministry on earth. Blood was the end of His ministry on earth, but not the end of His ministry. Now He has the ministry as high priest, and He has sent back His spirit. Spirit, he has the ministry of sending his spirit back. So we have water, the beginning of his earthly ministry. We have the blood, the end of his earthly ministry. And we have the spirit, the continuation of his heavenly ministry. Come on, are you, are you with me? Are you with me? Now, Jesus Christ revealed as God the Son by baptism of water, shedding of blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. What came out of his side when he was pierced? Water and blood. And the Spirit 
who is truth, confirms it with his testimony. We have these three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. The blood and the Spirit agree. The blood releases the anointing. Because there was blood at the cross and Jesus was resurrected righteous and holy before God and sits on the right hand of the power. What is he doing? What is his ministry now? He's a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He sends his Spirit back into the church so that we are empowered to do the works of Christ on the earth. Hallelujah. Okay, this is my last, my, my last passage. Say, well, I'm still with you, Pastor. I'm still with you. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, that's good to know. Because we've all had plenty of weaknesses, have we not? I'm telling you what, we've had some, some uh, moments of great glory and some depths of despair, have we not? Jesus can sympathize, but was in all points tempted as we are, as we are yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come, that's the blood, we can come to him now. Let us come, that's the blood, we have permission, we have access that we can come. But what does he say? Come boldly, that's the spirit, that's the anointing. We can come because of the blood, but we come in a manner that is bold because we've been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Come to the throne of grace that we may obtain. <laughs> Hallelujah. We come boldly because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We come boldly. We've been allowed by the blood to gain entrance. We have, are anointed with boldness by the Holy Spirit. Now we can obtain what we need in times of health. We can obtain mercy. We can obtain grace in times of help, in times of need. Everything that we have need of is found in the grace of God. How did you get it? Because of the blood and because of the Spirit. Give the Lord a good God bless. Hallelujah. Do you believe it? Give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, stand up with me this morning. Let's praise Him. Let's magnify Him. Let's glorify him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.